You are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Who are you to judge your neighbor? Uh, We're going to just kind of learn this last little part right now. It's really easy. The gestures, I think, is fairly, fairly simple, a little bit silly. But anyway, this is it. Ready? Stop slandering. So this is you slandering. You're all you're wondering, like, what in the world is slander? We're going to talk about it tonight. Stop slandering. Slander ignores the Savior. Good work, Jane. All right, ready? Stop slandering. Slander ignores the Savior. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. How do you know your faith is real, though? How do you know your faith is real? That's what this entire middle section in the letter of James has been talking about. Matter of fact, James has been arguing that your phony faith, remember, is your faith true faith from above or phony faith from below? Phony faith betrays itself. It betrays itself in all sorts of ways. It betrays you in how you interact with others. It betrays you in how you interact with God's word. How do you respond to God's word? Do you respond with anger? Do you fight against it? Do you argue with it? You are confronted in who you are according to God's word and you resist it. Phony faith betrays itself in how you respond to God's word. It betrays you in, in how you interact. Remember, personal favoritism. I'm, 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 I'm kind of judging people by what I like to see, and I'm only choosing friends uh, between the people that I think are cool to be around. Your faith betrays you. And I hope you've noticed this in James. He spends a lot of time talking about what really betrays you the most. And it's your tongue. You want to know if your faith is true faith from above or phony faith? It's this. Do you have control Of your mouth. True faith, right? Helps the weak, controls the mouth, and turns away from the world. But the the mouth is the porter through which you see your soul and your faith. Is it true faith from above? Are Are you living on true spiritual wisdom or is your life based in phony faith? There's a there's a line from the movie Han Solo. Not Han Solo, it's not a movie. Solo. There's a line from Obi Wan, the the show Obi Wan, where they're hunting all these Jedi, right? And the famous line that they, the the what are those people called? Inspectors, inquisitors. Inquisitors, Yeah, (laughs) I don't care about Star Wars, right? Obviously, from the teams that I chose. Um, The famous line that the inquisitors say about the Jedi is what? The Jedi. Yeah, you guys don't watch that show, apparently. They say the Jedi are easy to find because they hunt themselves. Remember that line? Yeah. Right? Basically, the Jedi must do good. They are compelled to help the weak. And that's how they always reveal themselves. The Jedi hunt themselves. You could say that about phony faith, too. Phony faith hunts itself. It will reveal itself. What you really believe, what you really want on the inside, will show up. And it will show up most clearly for you in how you speak to others. There's also another illustration here. I'm not a poker player. And there's a reason for that. Because I don't have a very good poker face. There's this thing in poker, and I'm sure you've never played poker before. But it's called a tell. Everybody has their own tell. It's something they do unconsciously, not even realizing that they're doing it, that exposes, maybe it's twirling their hair, maybe it's like, it's like trying to look straight, straight, maybe it's itching something. It's something that they do that they don't even think about doing that reveals how they truly feel about their hand. It's a tell. It betrays their hand. I know you actually have a high hand and you're bluffing. I know you actually have a low hand and you're bluffing because... You're tell. You're breathing really heavily. What? I didn't breathe really heavily. I've been watching you all game. The same way it is with your faith. Your faith will tell, will show itself, will betray you. 
and primarily, don't you see this, at the very end of this middle section, James seems to be slamming it home again and again and again. Slander betrays your faith. It shows you your faith. It tells you. It tells you what your faith truly is in. Slander betrays you. What exactly, what exactly is it that slander betrays? What exactly is it that running down other people with the way you talk about them, ruining their reputation, what exactly is it that it is betraying, that it is telling about your faith and about your heart? It's betraying your spiritual view. It's betraying your feelings about everything and every one. I want to just, I want to just to kind of show you four things. I want to show you four things that a slanderous mouth betrays in you. Number one, it betrays that you have a low view of others. Slandering with your mouth shows you that you have a low view of others. Notice verse 11, the first part of verse 11. Do not slander one another, brothers. Notice he's referring to them once again, like he has before, as brothers. What does this mean? You are, at least, you claim to be Christians. And and you're talking about other brothers, brothers, one another, brothers. This is James' word for believers, members of the family of God. You are speaking to them. Who are the brothers in James? We've been, we've been seeing it all throughout James. Uh, once again, James refers to these people as in chapter 119, beloved brothers, you are loved by God, and therefore you are loved by me. You are beloved to me because you are beloved to God. He also refers to them in 2 verse 5 as those who are rich in faith. You are rich through faith in promises from God. Those are the brothers. You, in 2 verse 3, through faith, therefore, are friends of God. You, brothers, through faith, are friends of God. And then as we learned two weeks ago, 4, 6, you, brothers, have received great grace from God. Grace, ability to to even go after even your hardest, most stubborn sins. These are the brothers in James's letter. But you, James says, you are slandering those people. Those people who are beloved by God, who are rich in the faith, who are friends of God, who have received the very grace of God. You are slandering one another, brothers. What does it mean to slander? Maybe some of you are still not picking up on this, but let me just clarify. It means to, I mean, the word literally just, if you were to kind of take apart its various parts, which is not always the best way to translate a word, but it just literally means to speak down on someone. To speak evil of someone. You could even say it like this, like kind of in, in, in modern terms, or maybe this is 10 years ago terms, I'm not sure. It means to run down someone all the time. Constantly running them down, right? In how you speak about them. How you think about them. You're always running them down. Thinking evil of someone. It might all, not always be false words that you're talking about, but it's, it's usually false words, but the the main idea behind slander is it's malicious. It's evil words that you are speaking of others. It, it, It has a motive to injure, to hurt, to harm. Well, what is someone's most precious possession? It's actually not what they own. It's not the money they possess. It's not the inheritance that they're looking forward to. It's actually the standing of their name. And a slanderer injures the most precious possession someone has, their name. It speaks malicious of them, evil of them. Matter of fact, 
The, the aim of slander is to do one thing, to cause separation, right? It's either, I don't like this person, so I'm going to run them down in my mind so I can justify separating from them, or it's, I don't like that person, I don't want that person stealing my friend, so I'm going to speak ill of them to that friend of mine so that they won't become friends with that person. I don't want that person to kind of get in this youth group and disrupt things, so I'm going to kind of just spread some news about them, kind of just reveal some facts about them to cause them to never really feel at home here. Maybe it's just a little whisper that you give to a friend, hey, did you know what so-and-so did last month? Did you know what he did yesterday? I just, I just saw this. What do you think that means? Notice James puts slander and judge together, which really shows what he's talking about here is condemning speech, right? It, you're, you're condemning something or someone with your words. You're speaking evil of them in a way that just condemns them. They are wrong. They should be separated from, in other words. And, and just to put a little sober, sober icing on the top, you know, unbelievers do this to believers. Unbelievers slander believers. We, we see this in the Bible. But it's, it's not called slander. It's called, well, in 1 Peter 2, verse 12, it's called speaking evil of you. But you know what that's really called? That's called persecuting someone, right? So you can almost say when a believer is slandering another believer, it's almost like they are taking the place of a persecutor. Matter of fact, the word slanderer in the Greek is where we get the name devil. The slanderer, the believer, is taking up a role of the devil against this person to other believers. Now think about this. Why, why though, is it so easy to listen to evil things ill things about others, and so hard to listen to good things, upright things, pleasing things. Proverbs 26, 22, I'll read it for you. The words of a whisperer are like dainty morsels. They go down into the innermost parts of the stomach. The proverb writer there is describing evil words towards others as delicious, easy to digest. Have you ever noticed this? Why? Why is it so easy to believe ill of others and poorly of others and so hard to think well of others, particularly if you don't like those people, right? It might be fairly easy to think well of someone that you like, but when you already don't like someone already, it's really easy to hear bad things about them. And maybe, of course, uh, the person who slanders, who speaks evil of someone, kind of has a little a nice little language that they put on it, right? I just, I just despise immaturity. I just find immaturity to be annoying. Maybe they, they say, hey, just, I, just, I want to be authentic. This is how I feel about people. And I just want people to know how I feel. I just want to be honest about how I feel. Maybe they're a little bit more spiritual and sneaky and they just say, I'm discerning. But evil speech is evil speech nonetheless. The bottom line is, your speech betrays a low view of others, particularly when those other people are believers through your slander. You're you're not believing the best. You're not hoping the best. You're not pursuing the best. You could almost say it like this. You believe God's grace apparently isn't enough for that individual because I'm not going to believe and hope and pursue the best with them. I'm just going to assume the worst and even make condemning statements to others to point that out. So you have a low view of others. That's what slander reveals in you, but it also reveals something deeper, something worse even when you speak evil of other people. It reveals that you have a low view of God's commandments. It reveals that you have a low view of God's 
commandments. This is what James says. He who slanders a brother or judges his brother slanders the law and judges the law. Now, is this a leap of logic? It's not really a leap of logic if you think about it. Just, just kind of like, I'll, I'll pull it out for you a little bit here. To condemn someone in a negative manner like we're describing here is to put yourself as a judge over that person. And to condemn your brother or your sister is at the same time, in this manner, is at the same time to not actually obey what God has commanded you to do. You, you, are, you are not obeying God's clear command of loving your neighbor as yourself when you're just recklessly, thoughtlessly, maliciously speaking down of others. Uh, Leviticus 19 <clears throat> Leviticus 19, 18 says this, You shall not take vengeance, you shall not keep your anger against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahweh. Once again, this, this trivial speech that's just really good at bringing down others, that's really practiced in being critical of others, places you as the judge of others. And at the same time, breaks the very clear law of God and will of God in your life. And, and, and kinda, kind of in a roundabout way, you replace God's commandment to love and not obey God's law, and you essentially set aside God's law for your own law. That may be a little bit... Confusing, but notice what James says there. Um, the person who slanders his brother slanders the law. What, what in the world does it mean to slander God's law or God's commandment? It means the same thing as it would mean to slander your brother. It means to speak ill or evil of God's very commandments. It, it, do you get this? Do you understand this right? You are saying, you are saying, I can see this person perfectly. And therefore, the law of God that tells me to love this person as myself is not totally accurate, is not totally right. Matter of fact, for me to love this person would be wrong. That's what slandering the law means. It means the law is wrong here. I shouldn't love this person as myself because this person doesn't deserve my, lo my love. Therefore, the commandment of God is evil, is wrong, and you are slandering the law. You're putting yourself as your neighbor's judge, and you are calling the law of God, which commands you to love your neighbor, down. You have a low view of God's law. Now, I mean, there's probably a few objections that maybe you don't have, but just to cover them really quick, no, no, objection number uh, one objection. We'll go through one objection. And, and, and that would be, so then why then do Christians critique, judge, and discipline other Christians? Why do we have Matthew 18 in the Bible? Why are we called to be discerning? Why are we called to use judgment? towards others. Why do Christians do this? If, if whenever you are judging someone else, you are sinning against the law, which is commanding you to love your neighbor, and you are slandering the law, there should be no judgment in the church then. Well, no. In reality, we've got to hold on to all of God's word in this, and God's word also calls us to be discerning and make judgments, and even pursue discipline of sinful believers. So how do those two things go together? This uh, passage in James is not, is not condemning uh, the practice of church discipline. Once again, this passage in James is condemning a thoughtless, evil, malicious intent to bring other people down and separate them from you. But what are we called to do in, say, a church discipline situation? 
Why, what are we called to do when we are confronting a fellow believer in our sin? Church discipline should be happening all the time. But it shouldn't be huge. It should be little small little conversations. Hey, I noticed you did this. Why did you do this? Can you explain why you did this? Yeah, I shouldn't have done that. That was wrong. That was a sin. Will you forgive me for doing that? Yeah, I will. That, that should be happening all the time. But what's the difference between what we see here in James and what should be going on in the church all the time, according to Matthew 18 and church discipline? Well, just notice just a few things. There's a difference in the attitude. There's also a difference in the aim of proper, of proper uh, correction, uh, d- uh, discipline, you could say, right? We are called in Scripture, and we must obey this command too. We are called by Christ to pursue sinning fellow believers in love. We are called to that, and we are called to that with an attitude of love, with an attitude of, hey, our relationship is broken, and I want to seek restoration to this relationship. And, and our aim there, our attitude is love, not to tear them down, but to bring them back to us, not to separate them from us, but to gather them into us and to restore them into our fellowship. Remember, our attitude is love, but also our aim is different than slander. Slander wants to remove, to separate, to destroy. But discipline wants to restore. Matter of fact, this is why slander is always different than discipline. Slander wants to spread evil reports to everyone around this person but this person. Slander wants to stab this person in the back. But loving, but loving correction, biblical correction, wants to keep the circle of discipline, the circle of correction as small as possible says, I'm first just going to go to this person. I'm not going to talk to my friend about this person. I'm not going to ask for counsel about this person. I'm going to immediately go to my brother or my sister and say, why did you do this? This really hurt me when you did this. I'm troubled by this because you did this. And, and you want to keep that circle small because you want them to be restored to fellowship with you. And you don't want to ruin their relationships with other people if you don't have to. But if they reject you, if they refuse to listen to you, then you have to widen the circle, bring another brother or sister with you to show the severity of this and say, I I really want you to listen to me on this. And then if they refuse to listen to that, you widen the circle more and that's Discipline, but notice the the aim is to restore, and the attitude is love. You're not just going around destroying this person's reputation because you don't like them. You're seeking to correct them because you love them, and you want to see them come back, and you want to make it as easy as possible for them to be restored to you. That is not what we see here. You know what we see here? There's, There's this illustration I was reading this last week. This, this woman was really convicted about her slander in the church. And she, she came to her pastor and she confessed her sin, saying, I, I think I've been slandering multiple people in this church. What should I do? And the pastor's like, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go home. I want you to find a chicken. Apparently she lived on a farm. And I want you to grab that chicken. And I want you to carry that chicken all the way back to church and pluck out one feather and... Throw it to the side as you walk. Just one feather at a time. Just pluck and throw. Pluck and throw. Pluck and throw. That's what I want to do. The whole walk. Several miles, perhaps. All the way back from your house, all the way to this church. Just pull out feathers and throw them. Throw them behind you. She finally gets to the church. That was a silly exercise. Why did I do that? Well, now here's what I want you to do. The pastor says, I want you to go back and collect all of the chicken feathers that you just plucked and left on the wayside. She's like, I can't. They're in the wind. They're all over the place. That's what slander does. It's like, I've heard Pastor Steve say, slander is like toothpaste. Once it comes out, you can't put it back in. And you just have to be humble and recognize that. And the pastor essentially said, you need to go and collect as many feathers as you can, but recognize that you can't. 
And that should affect your humility and your repentance and your urgency to correct your wrong. But notice, all to say, that's the difference between what we see here in James. This is a malicious, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care. And what we see commanded to believers in the Bible, which is, I care so much about you that I must go correct you, and I'm only going to correct you. That is the difference between sinful correction and righteous correction, you could say. So you should ask yourself, are you seeking to walk in the Spirit and obey the command of Christ to love others in the way you speak? Are you seeking to love others with your speech? Or are you simply seeking to love yourself with how you speak? Is your aim in your speech about others, particularly the people that aren't in the conversation, is your aim with your speech to build up or to destroy? What are you doing to guard love personally? What are you doing to guard love personally? There's another story of a pastor. His name is Charles Simeon. He was a very influential, famous pastor um, in, um, in the 19th century. He once wrote a letter to a friend of his of how he handles evil speech. And I think it's corrective and it, or it's instructive for you just to think about how should I work hard to guard love in the fellowship of believers and even in my own heart in how I interact with evil speech. He says this, the longer I live, the more I feel the importance of adhering to the rules which I have laid down for myself in relation to such matters. First, to hear as little as possible what is to the prejudice of others. He doesn't even want to hear prejudice talk. He works hard to it. Second, to believe nothing of the kind till I am absolutely forced to it. He wants to be slow to believe evil things. Number three, he says, never to drink into the spirit of one who circulates an ill report. By the way, notice this. You've got to be critical in your thinking a little bit and discerning a little bit if you are going to guard yourself from critical speech. You you need to recognize this person who is talking to me about everybody else is a slanderer. And I don't want to fellowship with slanderers. I'm going to correct them, seek to admonish them, but ultimately I'm not going to listen to people like them. But he goes on, number four, fourth, always to moderate as far as I can the unkindness which is expressed towards others. And then fifth, always to believe that if the other side were heard, a very different account would be given of the manner. I just like that, right? Slowness to hear evil. Uh, a quickness to assume. To assume the best. To seek the best. What are you doing to guard, guard love personally? If you don't, if you don't, slander will destroy a church and a youth group like ours. You have a low view of God's commandment to love. That's what slander betrays in you. You have a low view of God's commandment, and this leads immediately to the next Uh, betrayal that slander uh, forces you to show yourself. And uh, thirdly, it shows you that you have a low view of God himself. That's what slander shows you. Chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse uh, 12. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. I don't think this is a logical leap at all. If you lightly esteem God's commandments to love, that means that you actually have a very low view of God's command himself. You don't think that he is the judge. That's what you believe when you slander. You don't see God as the ultimate judge, as the ultimate law giver. Notice this, not only do you break like that command to love your neighbors, but you also break the ultimate commandment, which is to highly esteem the Lord as God alone. Matter of fact, literally, the Greek here would say the lawgiver and the judge is one, which looks a lot like Deuteronomy 6.4 that says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, right? 
James is saying, if you have a low view of God's commandment, that's ultimately because you do not ultimately see God rightly. You have put yourself in the place of God. You've said, I am the one that's going to judge, at least in this situation, that this person does not deserve grace from me or grace from God, apparently, even though this person is a fellow believer. Notice how God is described. He is described as the judge and the lawgiver, but he's also described as the one who saves and destroys. These are quintessential roles of God. He is the one that saves, and he is the one that destroys. But what does slander do? Slander says, I will destroy. I will take the place of God. I will say, God, your commandments aren't good enough for me in this situation I should not have to love this person. I should not seek their best. And instead, I'm going to seek their ill. I'm going to take your place as judge. Uh, James rebukes us in 4 verse 12. There is only one lawgiver, though. There is only one lawgiver and judge, and only one who is able to save, and only one who is able to destroy. Now, admittedly, you might not perceive all of this, when you're slandering someone, right? You might even be thinking about the times you've spoken ill of someone and said, I did not. I did not have a low view of God. I did not have a low view of God's word, right? But let me just tell you this. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter your perception of yourself or what you think about your sin. What matters is what God thinks of your sin, and here you can see how God thinks about sin. One slanderous word betrays three heinous sins. A lack of love for others. Matter of fact, biblically, a hatred for your brother. Holding on to bitterness in your heart. Number two, a disregard for God's holiness and his commandments. And number three, a displacement of God from his throne. I should be the judge. I should be the lawgiver. I should be the one saying who deserves favor in this group and who doesn't. That's what you're doing. And this is a particularly horrible crime, I would say, for a believer of all people to commit against another believer because what are you saying? You're saying, listen, I have claimed the blood of Christ Jesus for all of my sin." But I refuse. I refuse to be gracious to you. I refuse to be kind towards you. I refuse to think the best towards you, even though God has chosen to love me. That is a heinous sin for a Christian of all things to commit against another Christian, a fellow believer. They seek to punish one another instead of blessing one another. And this betrays their low view of others. You're not really precious to me. You're probably not that precious to God. A low view of God's commandment and a low view of God himself. But this finally betrays one last thing. And maybe perhaps this is surprising. Maybe it's not. When you slander, you not only betray that you have a a low view of others, a low view of God's commandment, a low view of God himself, but notice this also, you betray that ultimately you have a very high view of yourself. That's where all of this is coming from. You have a high view of yourself. Who do you think you are? Apparently, you think of yourself as above everybody else. Apparently, you think of yourself as above some of God's commands. Apparently, you think of yourself as above God himself. Matter of fact, notice uh, 4.12, the end of 12 there. Who are you to judge another? That's essentially what James is saying. Who do you think you are? You think too highly of yourself, and that is where this slander is coming from today. Romans 12, Romans 12, verse 3, I'll just read it, right? It's a similar, similar thought. The grace, um, for through the grace given to me, I say to each one of you among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think 
as those having sound thinking, right? Don't get ahead of yourself. And, and right there, uh, Paul is talking about an unwillingness to serve other people because your head is so high. I'm not willing to be a living sacrifice to this person. Don't think too highly of yourself. Or it sounds a lot like Romans 14, verse 4, where Paul also says, Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. And there, there we have passing judgment for little things that's ignoring a big Lord, right? They will stand or fall before their Lord in these gray areas. Who are you to assume yourself as their Lord. Or you can say it, fine, you can just say it like this, right? You know, you know, you think you're on top when you look down on everybody else. That's, that's how you know you're on top, when you are looking down and judging everybody else. That is a sign that you think too highly of yourself. It's a sign that you are lightly esteeming God's command because you lightly esteem God because you're taking the place of God. That's what James, <coughs> essentially, is saying. I just want to do one final thing here. James has made a lot out of an argument from Leviticus 19 to love your neighbor as yourself. And I just want... That clock is broken. I apologize. I was wondering why you guys were looking at me so funny. I was like, I've got five minutes still. I just want to point out one thing, one thing. Turn over to Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19, I'm going to read 19, uh, 16 through 18. You'll see how this all connects. Uh, Leviticus 19, it's way back in the, the books of Moses back there. Leviticus 19, 16 through 18. And Moses says this. Notice the connections here to what James says. You shall not go about as a slanderer among your people. You shall not stand against the life of your neighbor. I am Yahweh. You shall not hate your brothers in your heart. You may surely reprove your neighbor and so not bear sin against him. Notice there is this discipline already in place there. And then verse 18, you shall not take vengeance and you shall not keep your anger against the sons of your people. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahweh. Now, just to remind you, right, James is probably pulling from this because he uses the idea of neighbor in James 4 verse 12. This shows us that he's probably Probably referring to Leviticus 19 here, but I just want to ask you a few, two, two questions. What does slandering really mean? And then secondly, what does loving really mean according to Leviticus 19? Slandering means you have set yourself against the life of someone. That's what it's saying there in Leviticus 19.6, right? You are set, 19.16, you, you are standing against the life of someone. You say, hey, your name is an important thing, but I don't care about your name. I don't care about your life. You are holding on to hatred and bitterness in your heart. And you are even, we see this in, in, in verse 18, desiring revenge. That's what slander means. You're standing against them. But what does love mean? Just love me. What does it mean to actually love your neighbor as yourself? It means I'm going to seek to protect your reputation like it's my reputation. It means I am going to keep the circles of sin small so that it doesn't ruin your reputation. It means you are going to seek their well-being. Remember that idea of loving their life. You're going to seek their well-being. And what, dear friends, is the way that we as believers Truly seek the best of others. Romans 12, Romans 12 tells us. It means you bless them. You bless those who persecute you. It means you speak well of them. It means you pray for them. It means you say in your prayers to God, Lord, restore them to yourself. It means you say to God, Lord, reveal their sins to them. Lord, restore them to fellowship. Don't let them destroy their life through this sin. And what's the real tell that you are praying that way? It's when you're also praying, Lord, restore them to me. Lord, make me an instrument to restore them to your grace. That's how you know you're really loving them. When you're set on their 
good. When you're seeking their life, when you are loving your neighbor as yourself. When even in your correction, you are correcting them as you would want to be corrected. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, we thank you for this moment in time where we get to read your word. Thank you for your truth that's wondrous and thunderous and convicting and challenging. And I pray that you'd help us to digest these things through small group time. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.